Good evening. We have an extraordinary interview tonight with a childhood friend of one of the men arrested after the murder of drummer Lee Rigby. He tells us something of the background of the man, why he converted to Islam, and he makes claims about what might have contributed to him becoming a radical Islamist. The interview was conducted just a few minutes ago by Richard Watson, who has reported on Islamic militancy for many years. Uh, Give us a bit of the background to this, Richard. Well, dramatic events tonight, Gavin. Actually, we've spent the last two hours trying to secure an interview with a childhood friend uh, of one of the men um, accused of uh, the murder. Um, we arranged for that interview. He came into the BBC. We conducted the interview. Immediately after the interview, um, I'm told three people from Special Branch were in BBC premises. They arrested the man. And, and uh, so, you know, very dramatic events tonight. In the interview itself, I think it shows quite an interesting uh, portrait of, uh, of Abu Nazeba, our interviewee, and also the suspect, Adi Balajo. And I started by asking him about his early childhood biography. How, how long have you known uh, Michael Abadaloja? Um We met roughly around 2002, early 2002. Yeah. And where did you meet? Uh, we went to Romford, Essex. And what were the circumstances of you meeting? Was it a social contact? Was he a friend? Or uh, no, I mean, uh, I used to go down there like to chill out with some of my friends, basically. And uh, uh, during the course of uh, going down there, we kind of like, I think one day we just bump into each other. It's kind of like strange, because uh, um, we didn't quite often see a lot of like, black guys down there. So mm -hmm. it was like, how are you? What's going on? How's everything? And we kind of exchanged numbers. And you know, from there, kind of the relationship built up. And at that time, were you both non-Muslims, because I understand yeah. you both reversed yeah. to Islam. I mean, I wasn't in into Islam, I wasn't in Islam at, uh, cause I came to Islam 2004, uh, late 2004, basically. And he came in about uh, four months after me, basically. Now, it's, it's, it is well known, it's established on the record that he was um, uh, known and he knew um, Omar Bakri Mohammed and Al Mahjaroon yeah. at the time. Did you know him in those circles? Yeah. I mean, he used to attend some of the activities there, but he was, a, he was quite an independent guy. He was never stuck to uh, one particular group or anything like that. He would go to various circles, listen to various people and so forth. So he wasn't really kind of like stuck only with, uh, you know, uh, Omar Bakri or Anjum Chowdhury and so forth. Like he would float about basically. But he knew them? Yeah, he, he was aware of them, yes. Mm. I mean, he had to attend one or two uh, events, yes. But at that time, I mean, obviously I've interviewed uh, Omar Bakri Mahad on yeah. many occasions and Andrew Chowdhury too. Yeah. Um, one of the core beliefs and, and things that they aspire to is yeah. Sharia law, for example, yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Was that your position and his position yeah. at the time? Uh, myself, I had that position, which uh, changed later on. But uh, uh, Michael never took that position, actually. He, was, uh, he thought it was more sensible uh, you know, for Muslims uh, to live in Muslim lands and basically want to you know, live by the Sharia in Muslim lands. He thought that made more sense as opposed to basically uh, living in the West and trying to basically uh, implement the Sharia here. So did he consider emigrating to a Muslim land? Yeah, I mean, uh, he did many times. You know, he, he, I remember he wanted to do uh, some qualifications in relation to teaching and um, he wanted to do a qualification in relation to uh, fitness training as well, I think, which he eventually did. And he wanted to really kind of use that to maybe go abroad and you know, live in a Muslim country. Well, that's, that's some of the background to the suspect, Adi Balajo, but did Abu Naseba give us any clues as to, as to what actually turned a switch in the, this man's head and made him into this violent person, potentially? He, he did. Um, he said that about six months ago, he had a conversation with him uh, in London, and um, he says that um, Adi Balajo told Abu Naseba, our interviewee, that he had had a very bad experience in Kenya, and now we don't have any way of independently confirming this, but this is the account he gave us. He said he traveled to Kenya, he was arrested and picked up by the Kenyan authorities. He alleges he was tortured and abused. And he says that he noticed that fundamentally changed his mindset after that experience. I think we're going to see something here. Now, you describe um, Michael Abadolojo as, in, in a way, as a gentle man, the way you're describing him. Yeah. The contrast with someone who is capable of murdering someone on British streets is very, very stark indeed. Definitely. How do you understand that? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe uh, certain events that happened to him recently uh, kind of had a, a, an impact in shaping, uh, you know, that, that change. And although that change wasn't necessarily uh, uh, 
wonder, became overt, you know, aggressive or anything like that. He just became more uh, uh, kind of, uh, rec uh, you know, reclined and less uh, talkative and so forth. Like he wasn't his bubbly self, basically, you know. And uh, um, uh, the, the recent events were, you know, about six months ago, he, you know, he uh, basically just turned up one day, you know, just knocked out of the blue, no number, no anything. And he said that, look, uh, basically what's happened, I went to study in Kenya. And, uh, you know, when I got to Kenya uh, in a particular village, we were rounded up by uh, Kenyan troops, basically. And uh, we were taken to uh, basically a, a, a prison cell, okay. And we were all interrogated one by one. And he said that basically when my turn came, uh, basically I didn't speak to them. Obviously, because generally like here, you, you say no comment and so forth. So I, I wouldn't accept, you know, to speak to them. And he said that basically the, the officer said, you're not in the UK. He said basically, you know, uh, you know taking his private part side, he said, I'll F you basically, if you don't speak. So, and uh, basically he said that they, uh, you know, they basically they beat him quite badly. And uh, his, uh, you know, his comment was, uh, he said, well, lie. Well, lie means, you know, it's like an oath, say, I'm not lying, meaning by God, you know, that uh, I, I feel shy to describe to you what they did to me, basically. These were his exact words. You know, I feel shy to describe what they did to me, basically. Did he yeah. tell you that he was physically and sexually assaulted? He told me he was physically assaulted. He told me he was sexually threatened. And he indicated, uh, from what I know of him, when he said, I couldn't, uh, you know, I feel ashamed to tell you what happened to me. As far as I understand that, you know, it's sexual, uh, it's sexual abuse, because there's nothing he will feel shy to tell me about except that. And when did he tell you that, roughly? This is roughly about six months ago. It's just an estimate. And did you have any doubt that he was telling the truth at that time? No. Uh, if, you, if you looked at his face, uh, uh, you know, and you... Uh, he was holding tears back, basically, when he was, he was mentioning it. You know, it was, it was, uh, I mean, my, my impression when I heard it is I wanted to hug him. You know, you, you feel, he's a close friend of mine, you know, and I wanted to kind of hug him, you know, like a brother, you know, to, you know, to say it's okay, you know, it's fine, you know, don't worry about it. So your judgment is that he had quite a profound change of personality after that? Definitely. He, he just became, uh, uh, it's almost like, you know, you'd say to him, like, you know, oh, yeah, uh, you know, we should, get, you know, we should try to give Dao, you know, you know, invite people to Islam. he will just be like, yeah, yeah, you know. Like, I mean, you just, it's almost like he just, uh, his mind was somewhere else, but his, uh, you know, his actual, his, his presence was, you know, was there, basically. Did he give any indication to you that he was capable of such horrific violence? No, I mean when, when I saw the uh, uh, the the the, fo the photos of him initially, I thought it was a joke. I thought like, no, you know, like, are you serious? Like, no, it can't be him. You know, there's no way it can be him, because it didn't make sense because his his whole concept, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 was. He just wanted to go and live in the Muslim land, basically, you know, and just basically get away from all the problems and all the troubles, basically, you know, because at, at, that, at that time, he was uh, basically being harassed by MI5. You know, this is something that he specifically mentioned to me. He said that MI5 had come to him. I think he, on, on, his, uh, on his return back, uh, he had been stopped. And subsequently after that, basically, he was followed up by MI5. You know, he said they came to his house. You know, they were saying, knocking on his door, knocking on his door. He pretended that he wasn't there. But they were knocking so much, he thought to himself, like, look, you know what, I need to kind of like, you know, come and show my face. So he came out, he spoke to the, uh, to the MI5 agent, and they were saying, that, look, we just want to have a chat with you, we just want to speak to you. So when did he tell you this? This is roughly about six months ago, roughly. And what was his reaction to being approached by the security service MI5? Yeah, the, his situation was that, you know, his wording was, you know, act there, you know, Ah means brother, you know, they're bugging me, you know, like they just keep, you know, they won't leave me alone, basically. Did he explain know? what they wanted? He mentioned that they want, uh, initially they wanted to ask him whether he knew certain individuals, basically. Uh, that was the initial issue. But uh, after him uh, saying that he didn't know these individuals and so forth, uh, what he said is they asked him whether he'll be interested in working for them. And do you think he did end up doing any work for them or not? No, I mean, he was explicit in that, you know, he refused to work for them but he did confirm that he didn't know the individuals that they asked him whether he knew.